Hello, this is Espresso from the Angel Swinger Club. Welcome to this weekend chat. And we have a very exciting one for you today. We have the generative artist Matt Perkins, aka Nutura, on the line. So we will talk about all the great generative art he's made. Before we get to that, first, let's do the usual Angel Swing intro by Casper. Hi, we are the Angel Swing, an international NFT art gallery and podcast show. Founded by friends around the world, Espresso and Johannes are from Europe. Yoon's from the US, Rebel and myself, we're from Asia. We're driven by our common passion to showcase independent artists and their art and helping them stand out from the crowded NFT market that's pretty much dominated by PFP projects. We showcase the art in on-cyber virtual galleries. A larger collection of art naturally brings a cross-pollination of viewership that has helped quite a few of our artists reach collectors through sales. We've organically grown since into a community of artists and collectors, but most importantly, friends. With regular Twitter spaces like these, which are then recorded into podcast formats on Spotify and YouTube. The easiest way to get in touch with us would be to join our cozy Discord. Everything's on our link in our bio, so hit us up if you're an indie artist who needs help featuring your art, or if you just want to join a friendly art and NFT community. Last but not least, we'd like to mention that nothing on this show should be construed as investment advice. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Thank you. So yeah, this week we have a segment also called News Updates. June, you prepared a couple of things for us. Yeah, thank you. That's all. So we have basically two announcements. Angel Swing launched a new virtual gallery exhibit featuring the art of seven minimalist artists. It launched yesterday and it's been curated by our head curator, Casper. And there will be the chance to win X5 on Cyber Gallery. And I would like to invite Casper to share briefly with us how he came up with this idea to create a minimalist gallery. <laughs> so I think minimalist art is something that I would say it's pretty new to me. And when I saw Transparent House, which is the gallery designer, design such a beautiful gallery that was futuristic, but yet had such clean lines and very minimalist in nature, I thought, why not invite artists who had that kind of art aesthetic that went together perfectly with the gallery? And I just thought of going to all these artists and putting up all the art on the walls and it just came together. I mean, it's never really that easy coordinating artists through time zones. Unfortunately, on cyber still requires you to click a link to delegate your art. But after that, that challenge was surmounted. Yeah, it was pretty fun trying to put all these pieces together and trying to organize it in a meaningful way through my eyes as someone who's relatively new to minimalist art. And you start to appreciate the beauty and simplicity. That's pretty much what I can say. A lot of these pieces obviously look simple to create or produce. But if you dive into some of the descriptions behind it, you'll find that, for example, some of the photography pieces take a long time before the artist actually is able to capture that perfect shot. So I encourage you to just check out the gallery, have a look, and why not snapshot of your favorite piece in the gallery and stand a chance to win an X5 gallery that's very nicely sponsored by Transparent House. Thank you, Kaspar. You really did a fantastic job. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> Yoon's one of the featured artists as oh, well. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We have another announcement to make. We will have Camille all next weekend as a guest speaker back on our show. And Camille is artist in residence with Bright Moments this month, and his project in Tricata just dropped as a in real life minting event this week. All right, back to you, Espresso. Thank you. Yeah, so this gallery is really something different. So I encourage everyone to go have a look. And yeah, let's get started with our main topic. And for that, I want to welcome Matt and ask you to introduce yourself and say a couple of words about how you got started and how you found the generative work. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me on the show. So my name is Matt Perkins. I am a generative artist in the U.S. on the East Coast. I guess I've been a creator for most of my life. I got into the NFT generative art scene December 21. 
I think. So I first started releasing on FX Hash in the December there. And over the course of 2002, I think, had quite a few releases there, ranging the gamut for more naturalistic looking things such as trees and mountains to more abstract works looking at noise and other things. Primary focus of my work is trying to replicate a natural media feel to it not quite leaning into the digital aspect of all the pixels on the screen, but trying to manipulate those so that they look a little realistic. Um, pens, pencils, paints, and things like that. Nice. So that's one of the things we're very eager to talk more about, like how you're doing this. But before we get there, your background, you went to art school, if I'm not mistaken, and you've yeah. been working with digital design for a long time. Yeah. As a kid, I was always pretty artistic. I liked to draw. I was definitely more of a introvert. So through middle school and high school, I um, found just usually sitting alone drawing. I took some art classes in high school and really enjoyed learning drawing and getting an education there. I also was very into computers. I know my father bought a, a TI-99 4A in the mid-80s and learned how to program basic on that copied a couple programs out of some books and magazines and started doing some games. Um, eventually we got a PC, I think it was an Amstrad, and found a copy of Microsoft Quick Basic. I think my dad got it for work. So I started learning how to program basic, got some books and found some references on, I think it was the Prodigy online service way before the internet in the early 80s. So started teaching myself some basic graphics programming stuff. A lot of it was, it was really generative art looking back on it at the time, but you know, then I just thought it was interesting to draw circles and lines on the screen, you know, change the shape, move them across the screen, changing the radius and stuff, and just creating all kinds of designs like that, lines bouncing around the screen. At one point, I learned how to program with a mouse and made a drawing program in BASIC. And I think my goal then was to create some sort of adventure game using the tools I made myself. I didn't get very far with it, but it was a lot of fun. Then later on in the 90s, I got a job at a local computer store building PCs for people in the town. And, and through there, I just discovered the internet and the dial-up and IRC and getting into bulletin board systems in the local area and in the broader area, exposed to ANSI graphics and on IRC kind of found that the larger international ANSI art scene with people all over the world using primarily ANSI graphics, creating huge scrolling artworks for bulletin boards, advertisements for bulletin boards, things like that. And then that was kind of the gateway into learning about the demo scene, which is primarily a European thing. There were some US groups, but, you know, programming to the raw middle of the hardware, doing all kinds of handsy and tricky animations and graphic effects. And it really fascinated me. I wasn't a good enough programmer to really get into that, but I stayed more on the art side of it. I got a copy of Photoshop, started to explore creating art with filters, scanning in my work, doing some basic 3D stuff with that. And then going into college, I first went in as a computer science major. And the goal was to get into some graphics programming and I guess making games and things like that. But I quickly discovered that the, I guess the structure of the academic computer science program where I went wasn't really what I was looking for. So I took some time off, got a job at a local multimedia design firm at the time. And this is really before the web hit it off. So we were doing CD-ROM altering with Macromedia Director some interactive brochure type things on CDs when that was a thing, some 3D rendering. And then I went back, I took a semester off, went back as a graphic design major at the same college. Also got a minor in illustration there as well. Did a lot of web development, micromedia director stuff, did some topography. Then as well, taught myself how to program on the web and micromedia flash. Um, graduated there and was working for a local dot com doing some web design for them, some graphic design for them, graphic work. Um, they went under, of course. Then I managed to find a job with a local company doing instructional development in their internal education department. So creating training for employees of the company. I primarily stayed with that. Well, I guess I still am with that. So that started around 2001 and is still my primary career. Through the 2000s, I kept programming and learning how to build things with Flash. Did a lot of really interesting things, did some serious game simulations, um, did some experimentation with Nintendo Wii controllers and seeing how we could use those for physical training experiences, um, some other in internal businessy type gaming simulation stuff. Yeah, I left that in um, 2011 and started working in different types of roles in internal training teams. 
where I would build custom apps to support whatever business need or team need. And I was the primary designer developer there inside of a larger team. So I was more or less a one-man shop having to draw all the graphics, all the design, UI, UX. Yeah, just kept myself busy with JavaScript, learning the newest frameworks, trying to recreate React more than one occasion, just as a hobby to learn how all that worked. And then that eventually kind of snowballed into finding the NFT generative art scene. Um, yeah, in early 2001, I think from a YouTube tutorial, just started programming with that and spent most of that year doing coding train tutorials and just iterating on different designs and algorithms, trying to come up with interesting things. And then that's that. That's amazing. So it sounds like the thread through all of that has been kind of the visual and the graphics side and how to use computers to produce the graphics you wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, follow up question. So have you been kind of more attracted to the code side of that or more pixel and bitmaps and graphics side of it? If that's possible to draw a distinction. <laughs> you know? Not really. It's very difficult. I think since I've done it for so long, they're very tied together. So even doing the application and the React stuff, I had a lot of fun programming. Even with Flash, doing programmatic animations, drawing assets on the screen using action scripts, not really having so many movie clips and graphic assets there, but creating them with programming. So to me, they're very tied together. Um, you really can't have one without the other. And I forgot to say, I have had other experiments of generative art. I think Joshua Davis was my first brush with it back in the late 90s, you know, outside of the earlier demo scene stuff that I used to watch all the time in the late 90s, trying to program creative graphics in Flash. Um, and I did a bit of that in the mid-2000s as well, but it didn't go very far, but it was a lot of fun at the time. But yeah, so, you know, to me, they're really tied together. So it's not using so many pre-rendered assets or created assets and buttons, but trying to recreate those with either CSS, HTML, or JavaScript. And just, you know, obsessing over buttons and things that drop shadows or the gradients across the buttons, <laughs> rather than just creating the assets or just creating the code in isolation. Yeah, I think that was what I was getting at because like for a lot of these things, you can do the entire task with pre-rendered assets. But personally, it's of course a lot more fun to figure out how to do it with code mm -hmm. and a lot more challenging as well as more flexible and powerful. Yeah, absolutely agree to that. It's a lot more fun to be able to just sit down in front of an editor and just write some code and just see a result on the screen. I think it's very visual. And if you go back to how computer programming was taught back then, a lot of it was some basic graphics stuff. So I think everybody started with Hello World and then making that just loop and display across the screen. So I think early on, the way we used to learn was very graphically oriented. It's maybe not so much anymore, but I think that's always been the way I've approached programming. Yeah, that's a good point. And you also mentioned how you could see the early work as also generative art. Can you give an example of what you were thinking about there? I was thinking, for example, in direction of Flash and programming that or other examples. Well, for me, learning basic, I think, was all about doing lines and circles and stuff. And then in Flash, Flash by itself is very graphically oriented. If you move along beyond the basic timeline animation, a lot of it is scripting you know, circles and other shapes moving around the screen and turning buttons and transition states. So it's always kind of a balance between what you see and then the code behind it to make it happen. Yeah, that makes sense. And you mentioned the transition into generative art on the blockchain. So do you remember how you discovered that field? Um, Twitter. I don't remember the exact tweet or what it was, but I've been on Twitter, I think, since 2008. So for quite a while, I've always followed a lot of artists and illustrators and JavaScript coders. And I remember... Um, I guess seeing images or tweets about art blocks and other chains, just back then NFTs and blockchain was just blowing up. And I thought it would be something that I could get into because I've been coding and creating graphics in very similar ways for a while and kind of knew how to do that. And I think at this time too, we were all kind of trapped in our houses with COVID lockdowns and things. So I didn't have a whole lot else to do. So I think looking at it as a new hobby to get into, just a creative outlet to reduce some stress and just contribute and just you know keep busy and keep creating and just something productive to do that I think really helped me at that time. I remember my daughter had a run and master's course on generative art in 2018. I remember taking that at a time, I think that was before Meridian and all the other art blocks pieces came around. So I'd seen it and been aware of it, but I don't remember the specific event that triggered it. Yeah, but you bring up an important point there, because I think when the history of generative art is being written sometime in the future, it's hard to go past the point of the pandemic, forcing everyone indoors and front of the screens and 
that big shift, which turned out to be a big boost for everything technical and everything based on the rate, right? Mm -hmm. So also curious about FXHash, transitioning a bit more to the works you published, quite a few projects on FXHash, all the way from the very beginning of the platform, and been a very big and important artist throughout the history of FXHash so far, I would say. What is it about FXHash that made you embrace that platform and release works and go that path? It's very approachable. I think FXHash is a very open platform. There's no curation to it. The Tezos chain is a very low-cost chain. It carries a lot less risk than, say, Ethereum does, because the amounts of money you're talking about are a whole lot lower, especially when you consider gas and things like that. When I first started doing this, I had thought about using some of the work I had created earlier in 2001 to do some short form series on OpenSea at the time. But when I went to publish them, I couldn't afford the gas at the time. <laughs> Because I didn't want to use any of the family's money. So I was just looking at the bank account I had for myself to pay for lunch money and, you know, going out with my friends. So I had a pretty limited budget to find out how I could enter the space at the lowest cost possible. And FX Ash was pretty new at the time. And it was, it was very approachable since I had a large collection of scripts and code that I had been producing all throughout the year. I read some of the documentation, the API stuff to see how to adapt my math.random code to use their FX RAND and to get deterministic results out of that. And then went back to the code I had been producing for a while and mostly for my own experimentation and my own curiosity and trying to pick the pieces that I had created that had some artistic potential and going back into those and tightening up the parameters adding features to them, making them work with FX Rand and shaping them up into something that I could share here. I didn't really go into it planning to make a whole lot of money or making a big name for myself. So I didn't approach it very seriously. I think it was only after I'd been here for a month or two that I started to realize how seriously a lot of people take this stuff. So I just looked at it as kind of a fun experiment, kind of a fun hobby. Um, and then going back through all of my previous works and just publishing to the platform. So I had quite a few, not far too many <laughs> releases in December and January. And I think at a point in January, I kind of had worked through everything that I had created before that and I started to slow down a lot and be more intentional about the pieces that I had created. I think going back to Crayon Attractors, I think was the first piece that I tried to slow down a bit and get more serious and more intentional with what I was trying to do at the time. And that kind of went into Fracture Cells, Cold Mountain, Orchard, and, and those pieces. I think they're a lot more space than my earlier work. And to me, show a distinctive shift in my art style and the way I approach this. Um, the community in the FX Ash community, especially, they're very positive, very open, and very welcoming. The collectors in the space, I know FX Ash has a price discussion channel where most of the serious collectors hang out. And just being there and talking to the people who are, I guess, spending money on the platform and getting feedback on my work, hearing discussions about other people's work and just learning in the space. And even on Twitter, for the most part, the people in the space are positive. For me, at least, it's been a very welcoming ecosystem to learn and grow and develop this craft in. You know, it's not 100% positive, but for the most part. Yeah, I think you're right. There are many good things to be said about FX Hash and the community, like you said. It's a very tight-knit and open group at the same time. So it's kind of easy to form connections with artists and collectors. Mm -hmm. I had a follow-up question. You mentioned you had actually made this code throughout the year. And then when FX Hash opened in November, you retrofitted to work on that platform. Mm -hmm. That's actually a good thing to hear because it's quite daunting to look at everything you produced and the speed of it. That's really impressive. Um, when picking the projects to put on the platform, did you have any particular theme or order of projects? Like, is there something about the order, like in where you group similar projects or not? Not really. <laughs> okay. So I'm kind of approaching this as a pure hobby, just something, you know, I enjoy. It's not my day job. So I guess I have the luxury there to be very loose with it and sort of follow my curiosity and do the projects and release the projects that are the most interesting to me. I think there's some similarities between some other projects early on. And I know there was between Orchard and Grove, those two projects are pretty similar and they were released close together. And then the two projects after that, Turbulence and Caustics, are sort of similar as well. I think after those, that grouping of four, I tried to get a little spaced about it. It's very hard to know when our project is finished 
because there's always something you can change, always some new feature you can add, and it's never 100% as good as you know it can be. So it's difficult to set a release for it and step away. And on some of those, there's multiple versions or multiple implementations of some of the algorithms that you can have in your mind. And you release one, but there's these other ideas that you never got because you have to take it in another direction. Um, so that's how those four came about. But after that, I think I've tried to not do that. So I've taken more time on each of the projects and tried to explore the space within it to try to get a wider range of features and implement the stuff that I want to. But if there's more ideas than I have that can fit into a piece, I'll just kind of put it in my to do later folder and come back to it in the end. So I've got a lot of half finished products based on other release projects that I'll eventually get back to. But there's not much of an overall theme or order to any of these projects in that way. Okay. And that leads nicely into focusing more on the art itself. And looking at your portfolio on FX Hash especially, you cover a wide range of styles and subjects, everything from abstract to figurative and nature inspired. So when you start a new project where do you take inspiration and do you start with something very specific in mind or is it more an exploratory process it really depends i think most of the figurative pieces so like for the trees or the landscapes there's usually an idea in my mind of where i want to get in the end um, for the more abstract pieces they usually come from experimentation so I think I'm a much better figurative artist, I would think, than an abstract artist. So for the trees, I think there's a specific style that I'm looking to achieve. For Orchard, for example, I really wanted to reproduce a more naive artwork. It's flat, it's 2D, and looks like it was drawn with colored pencils or pastels. I don't know. It's something you would maybe find at a craft fair or something. For sale at a table, just some very nice thematic natural media, flat piece like that. Um, looking at something like Grove and say Deep Forest and then my current one, it's much more of an influence from an impressionistic style, you know, from the way I approach the colors to the way I'm trying to reproduce the way paint looks. But when I'm creating a new effect or a new brush or something in your algorithm, I do do a lot of experimentation to see, you know, the different ways it can look. And usually the pieces are born from one of my interesting tests that I'm doing <laughs> that produces a nice looking result. And I just continue to iterate on that test and that effect. And I think planetary abstracts started, it took a lot of different directions <laughs> before it ended up there. I was looking at different ways to represent noise and noise fields with this colored pencil type effect. And then it eventually turned into that round, abstracted, circular thing that it turned into like that. Yeah, that's one of the more abstract looking projects. And as you mentioned, the impressionistic style is very evident in several of the projects. And you mentioned on Twitter that that's something you're focusing on. So what is it about that style that captivates you and interests you? It's really hard to say, but a lot of the natural media art that I created in college, I think I always liked an unfinished look to it. So not a highly polished Renaissance master type painting, but working with charcoals and pastels and pencils was always the most liberating thing for me in art. I think it maybe goes to some of my ADD. After I work on a piece for so long, I just get tired of it and just move on. I think that's kind of been what I've done with natural media stuff is left it largely in a sketchy or unfinished looking state. And that looseness and just that vivid exploration that you can see when you look at impressionist works. And then the way you can see the individual brush strokes and you can see the colors and the way they mix. And I think that really appeals to me that you can just see the foundations for how the artwork was created and just the free expression of the strokes and the way they mix. It just, it really appeals to me. When I was in school, I did get a, a book of art by Monet and, you know, Monet obviously for the water lilies. I was never that good of a painter. I really haven't painted much since that one painting class I took in college. But um, it just, the colors and the brushwork just really appealed to me. Um, looking at how to apply that to code, I think those are aspects, just the looseness and the way you can visually see the strokes and the pixels and the lines and dots and things and the color mixing. I think it translates very well to a generative medium. And it also contrasts a lot to what you would typically expect to see from the precision on computer and generative art because it's very easy to draw a line or draw a circle on the computer, but to make that circle look like it was drawn with a pencil takes a lot more work. 
I think just sitting there staring at a circle, tweaking code and refreshing for hours at a time, trying to make it look irregular. I just like that little tweaking also. And just sitting there fiddling with the parameters and just getting something that looks natural really just appeals to me. And I just find it completely satisfying when I step back and just see the way it looks. And, you know, stepping two feet back from your monitor, just thinking, wow, that looks more like paint than it does JavaScript. Yeah. So this is really amazing looking at these projects that you put out already and also you're sharing your works in progress from the upcoming project and how you make this happen is kind of a mystery. So I would love to hear more about art strokes with code from a high level and how you make these colors blend in this natural way because that's a mystery. It seems like magic. Yeah, it still seems like magic to me too. I have a couple of articles on my blog actually. It's blog.mattperkins.me. The last two articles I wrote kind of go into how I approach doing generative brushstrokes and things. So really what it essentially is in generating a path of points. So for like a line from point A to B, you can imagine intermediary points between the two endpoints. And then around each of those points, maybe you would draw like within a certain radius, just a couple of other circles. So there's like circles orbiting all the other points. And then you just transition them with code from point A to point B, just kind of smearing the dots behind as you travel along the line. I've approached it two different ways up until I came up with this new algorithm, which is actually using line versus a lot of little tiny circles. It was a whole lot faster and has really enabled me to do the newer work that I've been sharing. Happy Holidays 22 was just a real quick project I put out at the end of the year using this new brush technique. So instead of animating countless little circles in the thing from A to B, which produces really interesting looking results and gets really more towards how actual little particles of paint would interact with underlying canvas or paper. It draws lines between the points at differing degrees of detail, depending on how far the points are. But stepping back, it looks pretty close. And it's also allowed me to come up with better ways to blend it because I'm not so concerned with just blasting that many pixels and covering the entire canvas with pixels because I'm not using shaders. I'm just using raw 2D canvas JavaScript. I still need to, to take Piter's shader course <laughs> and um, learn all about shaders to speed this up. And then for the color mixing, there is a color mixing library that came out a year or two ago, Mixbox. They do use WebGL to reproduce the way pigments work and the way pigments blend with more complicated mathematical models than I can understand. But I was looking at that problem and I did find some people discussing it actually in a Stack Overflow post. I don't remember how long ago, but I think like everything in programming, it all comes back to Stack Overflow in some way. They were discussing a paper by converting your red, green, and blue colors to red red, yellow, blue color space, doing the blending there and then converting back to RGB. So that's what I've implemented with my new paint system. And that has a much more realistic effect than sort of the bright subtractive colors we see on the screen and it adds and blends the colors together. So it tends to make them darker and look more like something on paint would look because the more pigment you add, the darker paint and other media get, which is the opposite of the way colors blend on the computer screen. And it also gives truer blending of the colors. So blue and yellow do make green in this color space as opposed to sort of a gray muddy mess. And I've integrated that into the way I'm picking the colors and blending the strokes together. The way Happy Holidays and Lake Festival work is that it does a lot of drawing to off-screen canvases and then sampling those colors back and then blending them with the color that the brush stroke is supposed to be drawn with using that RYB mixing. And it creates that darker additive brush stroke you get. And I'm trailing it off as the brush stroke goes. So there's a bit of a gradient within each stroke where it may start off darker and has sort of a rainbow tint to it from all the colors the individual bristles. Well, my algorithm are picking up towards the color it's supposed to be on the end. And just layering all those together creates an effect of sort of older paint when you have some varnish on it. It's very interesting. I've done some experiments and just turn all the blending off and it looks very flat. So I think all that little color blending on each and individual lines and the strokes really is what's adding that painterly detail to it. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks for sharing that. That's so fascinating. Thinking about it, that's applying pigment and particles of paint out. The results are amazing. It's really good work. Hey Matt, really love the organic forms in your impressionistic work. And I think you really masterfully managed to capture the impression of a present moment and also the mood that different atmospheres evoke. So yeah, these are really great. And I really love particularly your Cold Mountain and Deep Forest project. 
these two really resonate with me. So I wonder, are there nature scenes in your impressionistic work that are actually inspired by replaces? Because when I look, for instance, at your Cold Mountain project, I had to think of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and then I realized that you actually live at the East Coast, uh, <laughs> yeah. North Carolina, right? Yeah, the mountains are pretty close to us here. I think I'm about 90 minutes away from Boone, North Carolina, which is in the Blue Ridge Mountains. I think I only have to drive an hour to actually get a good view of them on the interstate. Yeah, so... Cold Mountain was definitely inspired by some of those views and some of the mountainscapes standing on the edge of the Blue Ridge Parkway, just on some of the overlooks and just seeing the mountains go in the distance and the fog. And then I do a lot of trail running around here. I'm lucky enough to have a lot of trees and forests, which are easily accessible with very short drives from my house. So during the summer, I go to a local three and a half mile trail and spend about 30 minutes doing a lap out there. And just drawing inspiration from nature in those trees, which I, I try to surround myself with because it's very peaceful. It's a definite break from you know, staring at a computer screen, being on Google Meets and Zoom calls all day. So it's a good way to break that. And it's a place of calm and peacefulness for me. So I think that hopefully it comes through with the art I've done, especially with Deep Forest, because it was mostly inspired by that. I remember going on hikes and walks and stuff and taking pictures of the trees and just the way that the trees can just get so dense that you really can't see the sky or anything else through there. And it just looks like a dark mass beyond the trees that comes through and some of them have clouds and sky behind them. So there's a mix. And just with creating representational works like this, it's really interesting because different people have different experiences and different emotions can be triggered through representative work like that. And it's just fascinating to me hearing people looking at the mint they got or another mint or another piece of the collection and just what it reminds them of or makes them feel. And I really like that, you know, fascinating me with JavaScript code can produce graphics like this that create emotions like that in people. And it's just fascinating. And abstract works don't necessarily create that kind of emotions in me, but the naturalistic works always do. And just seeing that come through in other people's experiences as well. It's just great. I guess I really can't think of a good word. Yeah, I also agree with you that nature pieces really can evoke a lot of emotions. Not sure you would want to talk a bit about that, but if not, that's totally fine. I wanted a bit about how you actually pick your color palette. Do you actually sample your color palette from impressionistic paintings or how do you create these? Yeah, so there's a lot of randomness for the palettes. They're not quite as curated as you would think from the end results. I do have sets of skies and clouds and foliage and flowers that I sampled from several impressionistic paintings and also some actual photographs of trees. And then I have a set of highlight colors and shadow colors that I use. And there's also a set of brighter color palettes, so like more traditional five color palettes, like you would see for web design inspiration or illustration, more modern colors like that. So I'm blending all those together for the finer pieces. For the impressionistic works, starting with Grove actually did it. So when I'm picking color and I need a lighter value or a darker value, instead of just using a lighten function, just to you know, brighten that color, I'll mix it with a percentage of the chosen highlight color or percentage of the chosen shadow color, more like you would do when you do a traditional painting. So it's not like getting a desaturated white or a muddy blackish dark color. It actually adds a bit of another color tint to the piece. So a lot of the colors in the palette are more of a mid-value range, and then it tints them on either end and pushes them either towards like a cooler shadow color or a warmer, lighter color that gives that more varied mixing and atmosphere to the pieces. And then with the mirror brushing, for the start of each of the stroke, I'll get one of the painterly colors that the actual brush stroke is supposed to be, but at the beginning of it, I'll mix in like one of the random bright colors. So that kind of gives it a muddy, rainbowish look if you zoom in on it. And just the way all those colors mix together creates a unique, harmonious whole in the end result. And by tweaking the highlight color and the shadow color and then the brighter color with even the same color green or the same foliage palette, it tends to tint it or push it in more of a ominous or happy range. I've actually been using largely the same palette for trees and foliage and flowers and things for quite a while, but I've changed up some of the shadow colors and highlight colors. I've started looking at more impressionistic pieces and sampling colors from the dark areas and sampling colors from the light areas and adding those to the shadows and highlight palette. And that does make a big difference in the overall feeling of the piece. It gives it more of a, a richer, I guess, feeling. So yeah, I hope that kind of answers the question. There's a lot of randomness and it's all driven by the way I'm just mixing the colors. 
Yeah, thank you for sharing all the interesting details, Matt. I have another question regarding your process. So, so for your impressionistic work, I have the feeling that you try to reverse engineer the idea of um, painting that you may have in mind previously and wonder how much serendipity, which is exploration, is involved in the process of coding. Oh, there's a lot of random serendipity. <laughs> That's probably most of it. <laughs> oh, I think Sorry. I get lucky a lot. I guess maybe I've gotten better at getting lucky as I've done this because you learn what works and what approach will produce what specific result. But I think because I do have a day job, so I will be on meetings or doing other project work and have a code editor open. And you know, if I get bored during a call, I'll just go over and refresh my browser to go through a couple seeds and tweak my code and refresh the browser. So it's a lot of little itty, little iterative tweaks over a very long period of time. <laughs> then end up producing something like this. I haven't done this in a while, but, you know, looking at a uh, scan of a Monet or a Van Gogh painting or something and just magnifying it and trying to see how the strokes are layered on top of each other and watching painting tutorials on YouTube for how to oil paint a landscape and then trying to reproduce that kind of layering in the code has been helpful as well. Are you a Bob Ross fan? <laughs> Talking about <laughs> <Not> uh, <laughs> watching. <We're> not- <laughs> All right. He's very meditative and relaxing, but his painting style doesn't really connect. No. Yeah, that's true. That's a different type of style. <laughs> yeah. So, especially in the last couple of minutes, should we start talking about Lake Festival? Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious to hear more about this upcoming drop, uh, Lake Festival on Verse. And also because this is a different type of motif compared to the other projects. So, what can you tell us about Lake Festival in particular? Uh, yeah, I mean, feel free to ask additional questions. <laughs> I think after I did Cold Mountain, which was a big success, probably my first big success on FX Ash, I tried to think of what could I do that would be a follow-up to that. And uh, trying to do something more painterly, more impressionistic uh, along Van Gogh's Water Lilies was something that I had in the back of my head for a very long time, trying to reproduce. And the way it started was I was trying to come up with a way to draw like just a field of flowers with some clouds like in a painterly expressionistic way and couldn't get it to work with the code I had at the time so I just went back and just re-engineered my brush code and started doing experiments with that. I believe I shared some examples on Twitter of just having these crazy brush strokes drawing noise patterns and fields and then eventually moved into learning how to use off-screen canvases and did some circles with some noise patterns. And then those circles eventually turned into rings. And then I was just iterating on this ring idea and had an idea of like a rain puddle. So tilting it out of perspective. And within the rings, having them reflect bokeh and lights and things like that. So the original approach was to do more of a city at night kind of piece where you had just a view or an impression of like billboards and cars and bokeh and stuff like that as it was being distorted and reflected in the ripples of the piece. But it didn't quite, I guess, connect with me all the way. And then because I had the code, you know, set up to reflect canvases of just colors and shapes and stuff. So it wasn't a big reach to change what it was actually doing, what it was reflecting to trees and clouds and things. And then what would eventually become some of the first iterations of Lake Festival, which were mostly just the upside down trees in the sky and then the rain ripples um, being reflected. I spent a lot of time trying to get the pathing for the ripples to look right. So they kind of follow a sine curve through the water. And then someone asked me on Twitter, are we going to see any vegetation? And then that made me think, well, how can I add some vegetation to the top of it? And then I started to move the horizon down and concentrate on trees and some grass. And then the bokeh balls that I had being reflected in the water eventually turned into the balloons that are kind of waving through the sky. And then I spent a lot of time on trying to get the clouds right and the trees right, focusing more on, you know, the sky and the stuff above the water than I had been focusing on the stuff below the water. And I've been iterating on this same approach since December. So it's been quite a while with one project for me. I think this is definitely the longest project I've worked on. And I was approached by Verse a couple of weeks ago about releasing this project on their platform. And I just don't get the chance for their reputation. It's also going to have a physical aspect in their gallery. They're going to print out a couple of these about six feet tall, which I'm sure will be very impressive to see. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I'll be able to get to London to see it in person, but I hope to see a whole lot of pictures if I can't make it. But yeah, but just, you know, taking the step from this purely online world more through verse to a more traditional art 
space to having work showing in a gallery and kind of trying to bridge that digital to the more traditional art world is something that I'm very excited about through Verse. Yeah, and they are doing a lot of great work, as you mentioned, um, especially focusing on these large-scale prints. And is that something you've done before, like printed some of your pieces in scale, or will that be a new experience? Yeah, it will be a new experience for sure. I was lucky enough to found a old Canon professional printer, um, 13 by 19 prints. So I've been printing out my work on that year. Locally, I have not been able to find the printer to do scale prints. I know there are services online you can use, but I'd really like to find someone to go physically and talk to and feel the papers and look at the stuff. But yeah, no, trying to find someone to print at scale is definitely interesting. We did actually found a local print shop that had a, like a roll fed poster and printed out a 36 by 48 like festival I'm stuck in on my wall. I think I shared some photos of that on Twitter. But yeah, it really changes the piece seeing it at that scale, even if it's just a crappy $30 print on basic paper. Paper. Just seeing it big is definitely a different experience. Yeah, I can imagine. And as you point out, it's kind of another layer of complexity and opportunities, trying to find the right paper and the right code and framing and everything. And this verse drop, is it going to be a long form drop still, or are you talking curated outputs? No, it'll be a long form piece. So it'll be very similar to how the FX slash pieces work. So yeah, it'll be randomized when you get it. And I'm working hard to make sure that each piece is real good. I still have a few more features to add to the code and a little more cleanup to do. I think I'm at least a week away from having final code to then. It's releasing on the 13th on the platform, but I've got a little bit of time to get it cleaned up and mented over there. Yeah, very excited to see this well when it comes up on the platform and generate outputs. Speaking of upcoming events, you also have an IRL digital art event coming up in your local area, right? Tell us more. Is it a gallery showing outdoors or what? So there is a outdoor shopping mall close to my house called Brookdale. And they have a big, I guess used to be grass, grassy park strip area that goes the whole length of it outdoors with some large oak trees bordering it. It's very nice. They've been renovating it over last year. And last summer, they had a big grand opening for it. And as part of the renovations, they installed a stage with a very large LCD screen. And they had an opening event for it. And through some local connections, I was able to get in touch with the social media marketing manager over there. And she wanted some artists to showcase on the screen during the opening event. And I was chosen to have two or three action fields renders shown on the screen during the opening event last summer. And now they're just planning their events calendar for this summer. So what they're doing each month throughout the summer, April through September, I think they're picking a different artist to feature each month. And for every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, from 8 to 10 a.m., they're going to cycle through works from a specific artist each month on the big screen. So they come, have some coffee, look at the art, walk around to the shops, and have that artist's work displayed. And they chose me for May, so I've got to go back through my collection and pick out 10, 15 works of art to show on the big screen every morning on the weekends. And it's pretty close to my house, so I'll be able to go grab a Starbucks and watch my art cycle through on the big screen on the lawn. It'll be really interesting to see it that scale. It's different than print. It's a 1080p LCD. I don't exactly know how big it is, but it's huge. And it's, it'll be nice. Yeah, I'm sure that's going to be amazing, seeing your own pieces up on that big screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's different than looking at it on your own screen, right? In the other sure. office. <laughs> I just have a 27-inch here, so it's... It's a different scale. So I'm hoping to make some more connections to local artists, local collectors, and local events through this, just to kind of like have another dimension to my work beyond just the NFT space to get into my local art scene just a little bit. And um, hopefully this will help. That brings up a follow-up question. Have you tried talking to people about the art before they know that it's digital and before they know it's on the blockchain? Like how have you experienced that process? Because many of us struggle to figure out good ways to explain this stuff. I haven't yet, but I'm looking forward to the challenge. One idea I had was to, because there's a local coffee shop near here and I was going to see if they wanted to hang my art or hang prints on the wall of a coffee shop there because that's just something little small local coffee shops in America do is hang prints artists on the wall. I was going to see if I could get into that and maybe start some of those conversations that way because some of my work, like Festival especially, printed out 
even on 13 by 19, it's really difficult to tell what this is done with code. It, you know, maybe Photoshop or something, but you know, if someone knows this is done with JavaScript, and they, they can run this on their phone. This is what it looks like printed out. I think can be some interesting conversations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's so cool. And I think also leading with the art and having people appreciate the art is essential. And then yeah. if people are interested, they can hear more about how it's made, right? Yeah. As a space, we have this struggle of being attached to the NFT word, and that's certainly not helping uh, at this <laughs> point. So <laughs> generative art and code-based art, that's a lot more useful to use for explaining. Yeah, you know, let the art speak for itself, not necessarily the NFT or blockchain aspect of it. It's been so great talking to you, Matt, about your art and your projects. Um, any kind of final things you would like to mention or point out, places people can go to follow you or find out more about what you've been making? Oh, yeah. Well, you can follow me on Twitter. That's where I do most of my promotion and posting, I'm trying to get better at Instagram. If you go to my website, mattperkins.me, I have links to all of those places. My first drop is coming up on the 13th. Very excited about that. Nice. Yeah, we're looking forward to see it. And best of luck with the verse drop and the IRL display of art coming up. Yeah, it's time to go out. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, listening to our weekend chat. And be sure to catch us next week. Same place, same time. Thanks, everyone. And bye. bye.